Let's have this first lecture. We're going to be talking about hypothesis testing, which is really something we'll tackle later in this semester. Right now, I just want to walk through the logic of it uh, without very many numbers or anything like that, just because thinking about this is an important thing that we do in statistics. This is one of the more difficult things to really wrap your head around. It's got lots of little ins and outs and details. And if we can start thinking about it early in the semester, I think it helps us understand it later when we have to tackle it with numbers. So why do we learn this stuff? Because it's extremely common in statistics. Uh, so because of that, most of this course is dedicated to something like hypothesis tests, at least half of it, maybe more like two thirds of it. The logic of it gets a little bit tricky. If anybody's ever, ever had a, a formal logic class or uh, an intro philosophy class where you had to think through logical argumentation, this is the kind of thing we're thinking about. And it, no single piece of it is ridiculously complicated, but there are a bunch of little pieces, yes, no, this, that, up, down, left, right, and you got to keep them all straight to understand what the result needs to be, what's actually happening in the problems that we think about. And so it takes practice. It takes um, some just drilling and running through and working through multiple problems to really understand this. And like many other things in this class, it takes a lot of thinking about it, a lot of mental processing. The more time you spend with your brain engaged with the content of this class, even if it's just playing, thinking, using, the better you'll do in this class because the more you're going to understand what's going on with these kinds of things. So get prepared to think a lot and think over and over again about this kind of stuff, and then it will start to become easy after a while. So the learning objectives for this video are to understand conditional probabilities, which is sort of a prerequisite for hypothesis testing logic. Uh, just conceptually, we're not going to calculate any. I'll show you some calculations, but you don't have to do them. Uh, identify events and outcomes in simple probability situations. Again, you don't have to get too deep into this. We'll have a probability chapter later on in a few weeks, and this is just kind of a preview of that. Uh, identify dependence between events and conditional probability situations. Conditional probability always has uh, some events or one event dependent on other events or other event. And so try to, to identify which event is dependent on which other event. And then this is not the most important thing. Use correct notation when translating a word problem into a conditional probability statement. But this is part of the set of skills of analytical problem solving and quantified reasoning is being able to break something like a word problem down into some symbols that make it simple enough that you can say, ah, oh, it's this kind of problem. Now I know how to approach it. So that's part of it. And then finally, uh, it's always going to be one, uh, we're going to take just a two event situation, the simplest kind of conditional probability. And we can say that the first thing is A and the second thing that happens is B. Recognize that if B depends on A, then it happens after A probably, and that its probability is lower than the probability of A. So let's walk through this. If that was all confusing, well, don't worry about it. We're going to walk through it right now anyway. So probability, not conditional probability, is something that we deal with all the time. So we say, what are the odds my horse will win the race? Uh, we think about the probability of people getting together. We think about the probability of other kinds of gambling. Gambling is big for probability. A lot of probability examples involve gambling because it's, in many cases, a pure random process, which is hard to find in other places in life. Conditional probability adds a little twist. There's an if in there, or if, or given, or uh, assuming that, something like that. There's a condition. So not just what are the odds that my horse will win the race, but some sort of condition. What are the odds that my horse will win a race if there's no rain on race day? There's the condition. How likely is it that Janice will marry this guy? Not just how likely, but how likely if his criminal background check is okay. So first the criminal background check has to happen. And then we worry about the probability of, of getting married. What's the probability of getting a face card on the second deal if I get a two or three on the first deal? very gambling-y kind of situation here. So these are situations, and you'll notice that the second thing in the situation, the second part of the probability in the set in the sentence actually has to come first. First, there has to be no, no rain on race day. Then we can worry about the horse winning. First, the criminal background has to be OK. Then we can worry about Janice marrying this guy. So the condition actually comes first. In conditional probability, one thing is a condition. One event or outcome is the condition, and the other event or outcome is then the thing that we are concerned about, if the condition is satisfied, if the thing happens the way we're interested in. Now, there's a particular notation we use 
for representing probabilities. We do P and then parentheses uh, and then the thing that we're interested in the probability of. Sometimes we're really technical and we'll say P parentheses A star one, whatever. But sometimes we're kind of semantic, kind of even uh, a little loose with it. We'll say probability that Flickr wins. So P parentheses, whatever's in the parentheses, it's probability of that thing happening. Probability that mom marries Bruce, probability that you win blackjack. Now there, with conditional probability, we use this pipe, this vertical bar. It's actually, there's a key like that on your keyboard. Uh, and it means given, or given that, or if. So the probability of a win given no rain, the probability of mom marrying Bruce given Bruce's background check is okay. The probability of me getting a face card given two or three. I could be more specific given I already got a two or three, something like that. So let's look at this example and just kind of walk through it and maybe you'll start to get what this conditional probability thing is about. What are the odds that my horse will win the race if there's no rain on race day? Well, you have to have the condition first. So first we worry about whether there's rain on race day and that can happen two ways. I phrased it so it's pretty much a yes, no thing. I phrased it in such a way that it wasn't like how much rain or when will the rain happen? It's just yes or no, is there rain on race day? So we have the yes or no outcome there. So the event rain on race day can go one of two ways. Yes, rain, or no, no rain. Now, the way this works, the conditional probability actually, in, if one thing happens, it prevents anything else from happening. If there's rain on race day, you neither win nor lose because there's no race. But if there's no rain, then you have a race, and then you have a second event. And you consider, now that we know that there's a race, what's the probability that my horse wins? Yes, winning, no, not winning. So that's one way to look at conditional probability. That's the probability of winning if there's no rain on race day. How likely is it that Janice will marry this guy if his criminal background check is okay? First, the condition is his criminal background check okay. So that's the first event or outcome. I'm using those terms interchangeably, and we'll see later that they kind of are, in many cases, interchangeable. So I phrased this specifically to be a simple situation. So there's only two possibilities, yes or no. It's okay or it's not okay. So if he's okay, neither of these actually rules out all the others. So if the criminal background check is okay, then we worry about the question of whether Janice marries him. And so there's a second question. Question one, criminal background check, okay. If it turns out a yes, then we think about whether Janice marries him, yes or no. But if, going back to the condition on the left, if the background check turns out not okay, then we still have to go look at that question does Janice marry him, yes or no? And so those probabilities on the bottom, the yes or no probabilities, are going to be really different from the probabilities on the top, right? If his criminal background check is okay, he's, she's probably much more likely to marry him. If his criminal background check comes out not okay, well, she's probably much less likely to marry him because most people don't want to marry criminals, unless she's really like into that kind of thing. I don't know. Those people who write him to Charles Manson in prison, those kind of people. So let's talk a little bit about these diagrams I'm using. I'm not using super official diagramming techniques. I'm just trying to kind of visually represent what's happening here. There's some process or event in the little diamonds, and then there's the different outcomes that can happen from that event, that process, and then another random process, and that's the second one, and then the outcomes from that one. And we can write in numbers on those lines so we can talk about probabilities here. So each of the outcomes from the first event, the condition, they actually create a new event. That second event still has to happen. That's conditional probability. So let's look at a simple possibility here, a simple situation, it's gambling related. What's the probability of being dealt a face card if I also get a two or three? So first we have to consider the condition. Did I get a two or three? That can be a yes or no. Yes, I got a two or three. No, I didn't get a two or three. Now I know you might've been thinking get a two, get a three, get nothing. That's another way to look at this. I'm lumping two and three together this, this way. I'm saying two or three is one thing, not two and not three is another thing. Neither one of those is the other thing. So the probability of getting a two or three is a particular probability, and then I'm excited. And then there's another event to deal with. If I got a two or three, then I'd get a face card. And, or I might get a face card, yes or no. And if I got a two or three and a face card, I win. If no, I lose. If I don't get a two or three, then it kind of doesn't matter. I lose no matter what the way I've set this particular situation up. So sometimes uh, that's the way it works out. You really do need to understand 
as much as possible about both events before you can understand all the possibilities that happen. There are four possibilities here. You can get a two or three and get a face card, get a two or three, not get a face card, not get a two or three, and yes, get a face card, not get a two or three, and no, don't get a face card. So this is the probability of a face card given two or three. So the conditions, we can think of them as being upstream in the causal chain of things. You know, the causal chain, this causes this and that causes the other thing. Kind of upstream is the stuff that's back in the causal chain, the things that do the causing. And downstream are the things that get caused, that get affected by, by the things upstream. So if things happen upstream, then things downstream, those probabilities then change. So the probability of the second event happening, the yes and no probability, in all these situations we looked at is different depending on whether the first event happened this way or whether it happened the other way. So the, pro the first probability changes the possibility for the second probability in most cases. So sometimes one of the downstream events just can't happen, like rain on race day. Then there's no winning, there's no losing, there was no race. But sometimes um, the probability of a downstream outcome just changes. And so if that probability of the second event changes if the if the probability distribution if the the split between the yes and the no probability if that shifts between um, whether the first event happens this way or happens the other way then there is dependency then the second event is dependent on the first if the probability is exactly the same then there's no dependency but if those probabilities shift depending on whether if they change depending on whether the first event happens this way or the other way then we say that there is dependence or dependency it's two words i don't really know which one i should be using they seem interchangeable to me so this dependency means that if you want to find out the final probabilities at the very right hand side of these diagrams you have to multiply the early probabilities so the probability of this first thing happening and the second thing happening a certain way, you have to multiply those probabilities together. And since probabilities, we, in mathematics, we represent them as proportions, a number between zero and one, but never bigger than one. Well, when you multiply that kind of number together, the result is smaller than both of the original numbers, mostly. The probabilities are between zero and one. And when you multiply small numbers, they get even smaller, which kind of makes sense. What's the probability of me finding a dollar? What's the probability of me finding a dollar if I have a cold that day? Well, less than just finding a dollar, right? Because now two things have to happen instead of just one. So it's even lower probability that they're both going to happen just the way I thought about them. So let's go back to the face card situation because it's easy to talk about the numbers with this random process. The probability of getting a two or three is 0 0.15, 15%, 0 0.15, that's the proportion, uh, the probability. So if I get that, then I'm in the world of, yes, I got a two or three, there's a possibility of winning. If I don't, well, the probability of not getting a two or three is pretty big. It's 0 0.85. It's all the other stuff. 0 0.15 and 0 0.85 make one. So there's a low probability of getting a two or three, a higher probability of not getting a two or three. Now, if I get a two or three, then the probability of a face card is 0 0.25. And if I don't, then the probability is 0 0.75. If I don't get a two or three, then the probability of a uh, face card is 0.25 and a non-face card is 0.75. So that second event, getting a face card, does not depend on the first event. It's still a conditional probability situation, but there's no dependence here. The second event is still independent of the first. The second event probabilities don't change. It's 0.25 and 0.75 in both cases. Now, if this was a single deck, they probably would shift because depending on what you get in the first deal, now there are fewer possibilities or different possibilities for the second. <coughs> but let's assume this is a Vegas type situation where they have the 10 million cards and so the probabilities are always uh, unchanged. But if you want to figure out the probability of winning, you have to take the probability of the first thing happening, getting a two or three, times the probability of the second thing happening. 0.0375, so less than 4% probability of both of those things happening the way you want. And there are specific probabilities from the other things where, that come from multiplying their chain of events too. You don't have to know how to do this, but you should know how to kind of think about it a little bit. We'll get more specific, probably not with conditional probability. We're not going to do mathematical conditional probability, just conceptually. But I want you to see that the probability of the second thing happening a certain way, if the first thing happened a certain way, 
is lower than just either of those probabilities by themselves. Because when you have both things that have to happen a certain way, you're very restricted in what has to happen. And mathematically, the way we represent that is we multiply the two probabilities to get a smaller number. So all the ways you can be wrong and not win, 0.9625. So 0 0.0375, 0 0.9625, those equal one. Yeah. So the conditional probability here is the second one, but it's not dependent. The absolute probability is just the probabilities of final outcomes. Now you don't need to know how to do those, but you should know what conditional probability is, and you should probably you should understand that when the outcome of event B depends on the outcome of event A, of event A then the absolute probabilities of event B are lower than if event B was just happening by itself. So there is no way to calculate an absolute probability of an outcome of event B without event A. You have to have them both. You can't say, well, let's just look at B. You have to look at both of them. I know that seems kind of obvious, maybe, or maybe it doesn't, and you're wrapping your brain off this. You can't know the probability of winning unless you first know whether you what you got on the first draw. You can't just look at the second draw. You have to know what you got on the first draw, right? You have to know both draws to know whether you're going to win or what the probabilities are. I'm going to end this lecture right here. I want you to just think about conditional probabilities. Think about conceptual situations where... We, we wonder what the likelihood of this happening is, but only if this other thing happens. That's a lot of what happens in hypothesis testing.